Welcome to the World Famous Adventurers Club. My name is Grant McComb, member 1231, and it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Danielle Eubank, uh, an expedition artist, world traveler, uh, best known for her work, Five Oceans, I'm sorry, remind me the name of your work. <laughs> One Artist, Five Oceans. One Artist, Five Oceans. Uh, and tonight's meeting is very special. We are raising money for the Surfrider Foundation on uh, this Oceans Day. So give me a, a, a hand uh, welcoming our speaker tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Now to kick us off, we have a video uh, kind of going over some of the stuff that you've done. Yeah, there's not gonna be a quiz, don't worry. <laughs> In February of 2019, I embarked on a voyage to Antarctica to paint the Southern Ocean, the final ocean on my 20-year quest to paint every ocean on the planet. My name is Danielle Eubank, and I am an expedition artist. I started painting water in 2001 and have since made it my life's work to paint all of Earth's oceans. As an oil painter, I examine the relationship between formal abstraction and realism and the underlying preciousness of water by documenting it all over the world through paintings. I study lakes, rivers, glaciers, pools, oceans, and ice around the world. I've been on four international sailing expeditions. Two of them have been recreations of ancient vessels and ancient voyages. My first journey was in 2003. The Borbudur ship sailed 10,000 miles from Indonesia to Ghana. The vessel was based on stone relief carvings from the world's largest Buddhist temple. The second ancient ship was a Phoenician ship, a replica from 600 BCE. She embarked from Syria and circumnavigated Africa. The third expedition was a voyage to the high Arctic. It was an experiment where they took a bunch of artists and put them on a boat and took them to the Arctic so that we could talk about climate reality. It was a three-masted barkentine called the Antigua. One Artist, Five Oceans is my way of organizing and documenting all the oceans. I've painted the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian, and also the Arctic Ocean. And now, I have completed my fourth expedition, this time to the Southern Ocean. I have both sailed and painted all the oceans on the planet. I want people to really observe and think about water. If we appreciate our oceans, we are more likely to value and help them. Antarctica, my final ocean frontier, was intense. The quest varied from days at sea, listening to ice scrape against the hull of the ship, observing the immensity of the Southern Ocean, occasionally flecked by floating white dots that turned out to be enormous icebergs, dwarfed by the expanse of the sea. On land, glaciers completely lacking in pretense, with the power to crush anything in their path, remind me of our fleeting existence and remind me of the triviality of my daily concerns. For me, this is liberating and drives me to capture how Antarctica makes me feel in sketches and paintings. The voyage to Antarctica is complete, and my new voyage has begun. I have three sketchbooks full of sketches and thousands of photographs. I'm working these into oil on linen paintings for display in galleries and museums. Antarctica was a fitting end to my One World Ocean Quest as the entire planet focuses on climate change and adaptation and becomes more and more aware of the preciousness of this resource. It's been 20 years that I've been on this quest to paint all of Earth's oceans. That's what One Artist, Five Oceans is. It's one person, me, painting all five of the Earth's oceans and sharing my observations and passion to help our oceans and the waters of the world. What a great video to kick us off tonight. <laughs> 
<laughs> let's go all the way back to 2001 and uh, I guess start at the beginning. As an artist, what drew you to water? Well, I had no interest whatsoever in painting water. Um, I grew up on the Pacific Ocean and had seen the ocean, had seen paintings of the ocean, had considered it a, impossible, just far too, moving far too quickly, impossible shapes. I don't know if you've ever really looked at water, but it's very hard to tell what's going on. Um, and then um, in 2001, I was cycling through southern Spain, and I fell down a mountain um, and injured, got pretty injured. Uh, not, not deathly slow, so, but I got pretty injured, and so my friends continued on, and I had to convalesce, had, had to convalesce in a fishing village in northern Spain. Sounds, it sounds really Horrible. great, but I was, I was black and blue, actually. And so I spent my time uh, on the quay painting water. So that's how it all began. Was there a, a specific moment that you can think back to that caught your eye and you yeah. were like, I need to do this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there is actually, because there's a kind of a, a corollary to that story, which is that before I had broken my ankle, uh, my friend and I were in southern Spain and we went to check out a wildlife preserve and we were on this beach and my ignorant self thought, oh yeah, we'll just walk up to some lynxes and just like look at some lynxes, you know. <laughs> well, of course, they're protected, so you can't do that. Um, that was a very silly thing. But um, while I was there, I, as I said, I had zero interest in painting water. I thought it, I just couldn't figure out a way that I could say anything more about water that other people hadn't already said, right? Um, so I had my back to the Atlantic Ocean, in southern Spain and was painting the sand dunes. Well, I painted the sand dunes for three days straight in the sun, because there's no, it's not like there's any trees on the beach. And after three days of doing that, I turned around. And it was, I remember it perfectly. It was a perfectly sunny day, not a single shred of a cloud in the sky. And I looked at the ocean, this sort of stripe, you know, with the, it was white sand, and then this blue stripe, and then this light, slightly lighter blue sky. And I thought, okay, I'm not gonna run from you my entire life. I have to paint this. So that's how that started. Good. And I did. The very, the very first pa painting, I should say, it's this massive sun, um, sand dune with um, like, like this much water. That's the first one. Well, and you see that in a lot of paintings, I think. <laughs> Water is often uh, a supporting cast. It's, it's a background. It's, it's something to kind of draw the eye towards a theme. Mm -hmm. So to develop this style where uh, it's the focal point and very textured and visceral, you, you can see it, you can feel it. It's, it's very interesting. Um, now, are you, you're a classically trained artist. Not really. Self-taught. Not really. I have a liberal, I have a couple of liberal arts degrees from UCLA. So it's not like the classic, classical artist teaching where you, you're in a studio, an atelier or something, and you're, mm. and you're drawing for eight hours a day. No, it's much more of a fine arts degree from UCLA. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, as you develop your artistic uh, style, what mediums did you experiment with water, and which did you find work better than uh, the rest? I am very passionate about kind of old school. Um, so I use uh, paint whose ingredients and, and um, recipes are from the 17th century, many of them, um, and some of the finest ingredients. I paint on linen, so these are uh, oil-primed linen, so my, the way that I paint or the materials that I use are the same that somebody in the Renaissance would have used. Um, from the Renaissance onward. Um, and I think that's kind of to make a statement. I, I really wanted to get my hands dirty, you know, um, and kind of get away from the perfect computer kind of generated art, which mm. a lot of us appreciate and a lot of us make and a lot of us see. But I really wanted to get into that very visceral oil painting technique. Now, are these paints that you make yourself? Do you no, blend the colors no. and do you? I could, 
but I could, but I don't have time. No, no, yeah. I don't. That Too would be great. busy painting beautiful portraits of water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you're an artist, you're an expedition artist. How did that come about uh, after you discovered the love of water? So I, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I had been painting water ever since this time that I fell down a mountain on my bicycle and um, fell in love with it. I was painting uh, the English Channel. I was painting the Atlantic. Um, I, had, I was living in London at the time and I got a phone call as you do, and my friend who was a collector of my work said, um, what are you doing for the next six months? And I said, well, it depends on what you, why do, why do you want to know that, you know? And um, he had already sort of lined me up to be an expedition artist with this guy, Philip Beale, who I didn't know, and he had only just met, um, who was building a, an eighth century uh, replica Indonesian boat. And so uh, he had kind of promised my work to this guy and said, you know, it's not an expedition unless you have an expedition artist. So That's great. I said yes. So how long did it take him to build this boat? It took him four months to build this boat. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah, very fast. It is fast. very fast, yeah. Um, and that's the boat there. That's a Borbador ship expedition, or Borbador ship. Um, and it was built in Indonesian, Indonesia by uh, very, very skilled uh, shipwrights. Do you know the total length and, us. and the size of the ship? Yeah, it's 18 meters. Yeah, it's um, quite an interesting vessel. So it's, as I said, 18 meters. The hu it has a hull, and then it has um, a gallery on either side, so you can walk in either side. And then from that point, there are outriggers on both sides. And as you can see from that photograph, um, it's got two biped masts, very unusual kind of mast that can be both latine rigged or square rigged. Yeah, what a fantastic example of just a, a fantastic ship. Talk to me about, it's a six month voyage, mm -hmm. so you're living out of this boat with how many mm -hmm. other people? Uh, there are about 12 of us. 12 of us, yeah. all kind of crammed yeah. into this boat. I mean, presumably it's a pretty large boat, so you're not on top of each other, but depending on how it was organized, you were probably stepping over each other here and there. You know, I like to think of it like camping, you know, it's like camping with 12 people that you don't know, and you're not allowed to leave the campsite. It's kind of like that. And actually, you'd be surprised. It'd be, you saw the picture of it. It's such an interesting design. It's such a strange shape that there are all kinds of nooks and crannies in different places that you could hang out and, um, and not see anyone. And of course, we're all crew members, mm -hmm. so everybody's uh, doing their crew activities. What did the uh, well. facilities look like? The galley, the, the restrooms, the, <laughs> the rec areas? You know, this is a ship from, uh, what is it, 800 CE? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there. So we all slept in um, bunks. Now you you need to know that when this was built, there were a few inventions that hadn't been invented yet, like the wheel. Um, like so, naturally, there were no such thing as pulleys, so we, we used blocks instead. There was one um, room below deck where there were bunk beds, um, which was also where the cheese was stored. <clears throat> uh, and then there was a yeah, there was a galley that had um, a table and a chart table as well, um, and that's sort of it. Oh, oh, yeah. You you want to know about the head, right? The, um, the facilities. So there was no there was no um, running water, there was no oven, there was no way to cook food except for we had two walks that we used. So we would put those um, on the foredeck and actually um, a stern and and just sort of crouch down on the floor and uh, cook in these walks. Um, and then um, the head was um, the, over the side of the ship. So you had to cl climb over the railing, if you will, of the deck into this um, kind of box where there were these bits of wood that went up to about here. And then there were slats underneath that. And you would do what you would do there. And then at the same time, 
you know, it's, it's, they're just slats of wood. So you're right there on the ocean doing this. I mean, the boat's doing this, and you're doing this, yeah. and <laughs> the waves are doing this. <laughs> so everyone's in their element. Oh, it was great. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. So over the course of this six-month voyage, walk me through where you went and uh, some of the um, moments of inspiration that you pulled from and, and kind of put into your paintings. Yeah. Uh, so as I mentioned, the boat was built in Indonesia, um, and then we sailed it um, across the Indian Ocean to Seychelles. And for that leg, I actually flew ahead of the crew. Um, and um, set up my studio in Seychelles. So I got to be in Seychelles for six weeks, which was great painting, and um, setting up things with the harbor master and getting everything ready for them to come. And then we um, sailed down to uh, Madagascar, and then Cape Town, and then up the west coast of Africa to Ghana. Great. Yeah, what a fantastic yeah. expedition in this, yeah. uh, this ship. Um, talk to me about how the water changed. Because you're presumably, you're watching the water, you're watching the ship, you're painting uh, parts of this expedition. Um, walk me through some of those key moments. Well, this is really the expedition that gave me the idea to paint water in mm -hmm. all of its different forms. Because although I had been painting water for a number of years, I hadn't been, you know, like literally looking at it 24 hours a day, right? It looks, um, the Indian Ocean, I would say, is probably the most beautiful ocean in a way, insofar as it has the most variety of colors. It has um, a lot of really warm hues when you're right on the equator. You have those super fast sunrises and sunsets. Um, and then, uh, depending on how the wind is, it can change the different kinds of waves and wavelets, and, and if you're going to have a white crest on some of the, of the waves or not. Yeah. That's great. That's fantastic. And this wasn't the only uh, historical ship that you traveled on. No, there's another one. So let's talk about the next one. Yeah, the Phoenicia. So the Phoenicia ship expedition is um, an expedition wherein we retraced what Herodotus had said that the Phoenicians did. So the ship is from 600 BCE, or replica 600 BCE vessel. And um, from the picture that you just saw, you'll see that it's a lot like the boat that you probably drew when you were little, and somebody said, draw a boat, and you drew that, right? Um, now think, this is 1,200 years older than the last boat that I just talked about, right? I wouldn't even so, ask what the head on that one. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Same, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so a replica 2,500-year-old boat. So we built it in Syria, and then we sailed clockwise around the continent of Africa. Wow. Now, did you have a hand in, in building either of these boats? Did you show up and, and try to... Yeah, as did my husband, who's in the audience. Oh, yeah, wow. absolutely. Um, I mean, there was a... a incredible shipwright who did the heavy lifting. But um, in terms of anything we could do, if it meant helping weave some of the ropes or painting the canvas or putting, uh, you know, caulking in between the, the planks, that that's, those are the kinds of things that we did. And do you feel participating in that way was important for your work, important for your art? It's important for me as a person. Talk to me about that. Um, I like to be, I'm not, I'm not a, a spectator, you know? I like to be involved. I like, if somebody's cooking in the kitchen, I want to go in and help. If somebody's doing something outside, I want to go in and help. If, um, you know, if my daughter's playing soccer, I really want to, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm, the, I'm that kind of person that kind of inserts myself in things because I enjoy the experience of doing things, which I think is what, you know, the Invent Adventurers Club is about, right? I mean, people enjoy that experience, and I'm very much like that, too. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And do you think that, you know, urge to do impacted the style of art? 
that yeah. you've developed. Absolutely, yeah. I, because my work is, um, it's a portrait of water, right? Um, you can see some of my materials there. That is from Syria um, at about um, 5.30 in the morning. Now, you'll notice the most important object there is the coffee, right? And the people were so sweet. They would see me out there at 5.30 in the morning and they'd bring me these very strong, very delicious cups of coffee, which was, which was really nice. But yeah, my, uh, my artwork is, it's not just about looking at things that are off in the distance. It's about being involved. It's about having an, um, an interactive relationship with that thing. And then that, I think, very much gets uh, communicated with the audience. You know, it's, it's very interactive. It's the history of the water. It's what were people doing with the water. It's who or what lives in the water or doesn't live in the water. It's everything about um, the experience of that water. Now, in the last photo, there was a sketch. Yeah. And it was of a boat. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the other things you paint and enjoy painting and, and presumably painted on this expedition. <laughs> yeah, my secret sketchbook. No, that is the Phoenicia ship um, as it was being built. Um, I. Uh, sketched all of the crew members. I also take photographs, so I do photographic portraits of all the crew members and people that we've met along the way. All of the different places that I've traveled, and I'm, I'm sure other everybody else in the audience has had the same experience, um, you, you meet people, but also when you're on a ship like any of these ships, when you get to a place, quite often there'll be a formal ceremony. Sometimes there'll be dances, sometimes you'll meet um, um, the king of the local area or the president of Indonesia or something like that. And so I try to, uh, when I can, uh, do formal photographs and also sketches of everybody that I see. Do you ever present your art to, uh, to those notable? Uh, no. 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 They, no. Little business card? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> well, let's move on to the next um, painting of water. Perfect. <laughs> So this is, um, this is a demonstration of what my process is. So this is where the boat was being built in Syria. Now you'll see, hopefully um, on that screen, the kind of rubbish and pollution and garbage mm -hmm. that's in the water. Um, and then you see the reflection of the boat. Now if you look at the next photograph, um, you'll see, well, more um, rubbish. The, uh, every single place that I have been, there has been pollution. And that's not like a Syria thing. It's England, it's the United States, it's Mexico, it's every single country that I've ever been. Um, then if you look at the next photo, you'll see that's my painting. So that's my response to what I'm looking at, what I'm sitting amongst. Um, so when I sit and sketch, I sit on the ground and I'm actually sitting in the trash quite often. Um, or, you know, especially in shipyards, right? Because there's all kinds of uh, debris that's been discarded along those. And so this is my response. Yeah, what a, what a sorry, what a great response to um, <laughs> what a lot of people would look at and you know think rubbish. Like this is this is ugly. This is something that's um, uh, almost a scar on the face of uh, this beach or this water. And to kind of pull this beautiful work from it is uh, inspiring. Um, you know, if we were going to talk about what you wanted that specific piece to evoke in someone, um, did you have something in mind, or or um, what, what would you like the viewer to? feel when they see that. So the great thing about art is that you can communicate emotion, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like music in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what my work is about, is it, it's about getting somebody to feel something and getting somebody to look at these things that are distasteful. Nobody wants to look at a bunch of trash, right? But actually, um, I've been told that some of my uh, most beautiful paintings are of uh, the water in Jakarta, where it's so polluted that there are days when the sun doesn't ever come out because there's a layer of, of pollution in the air. And it makes the water this really beautiful orange color. <laughs> I'm sad to say, but 
it gets people to look and it creates that conversation. Well, why is it that orange color? You know, what's, what's going on here? That's great. And to pull those threads as an artist and, and really find beauty in what would otherwise be um, trash. Yeah, thank you. Audience <laughs> participation is encouraged here. Uh, so uh, there's a map in front of us, the Arctic, and I'd love to dive into the Arctic. I know we've got some great uh, pictures and, and paintings from the Arctic. How did the Arctic expedition come about? So the Arctic expedition is more of um, uh, artist... Um, uh, it's kind of like a grant, right? It's kind of like an artist experience, something that you apply for. Um, and I applied for, and they uh, they said yes. And uh, along with a bunch of other artists, um, architects and all different sculptors, sound artists, all different kinds of artists, um, where we were on a three-masted barkentine, and we sailed, well, you can see the route that we sailed there, right up um, in Svalbard, right up all the way past the kind of northern tip of Svalbard, um, just about where the sea ice starts in the North Pole. Not quite, but just about. And if you look at the map, sorry, if you look at the map, you see the tiny little red dot at the top? That's where we were. Mm. So it gives you an, a little bit of an idea of, uh, of how far north that, of how far north the North Pole is, right? Um, yeah, so that's where we were. And that was, um, that was, you know, artistically probably the most difficult thing that I've ever had to do. Because what I have been doing is I've been taking something that people see every day, whether it be water or pollution or something like that, and making, and making it abstract and making it something that you'll be interested in looking at. Hmm. Then I get to the Arctic, and everything's already abstract. Nothing looks, quote unquote, normal, right? It's like Middle Earth is gone. <laughs> we're, we're way out, you know, goodbye, Dorothy, goodbye, Middle Earth, whatever your reference is. We're like into places where the mountains don't look like mountains. The water doesn't look like water. The ice doesn't look like ice. The sun doesn't act the way it's supposed to act. The top level uh, layer of Earth doesn't act like Earth. It's mm -hmm. actually liquid up there, right, with permafrost. Um, so nothing behaves normally. So after I got back from the Arctic expedition, um, I had about, you know, I had a several sketchbooks full of sketches, as well as about 4,000 photographs. and. Uh, it was very, very difficult for me to find my voice. I think that was very, very difficult. Yes. I, think, I think I did. I guess the question is, how do you abstract the abstract? How do you abstract the abstract? Exactly. I don't know. So how did you solve that, that conundrum? I had to dig really deep inside myself and really focus on what the emotion was that I wanted to convey. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Now, because I know uh, a lot of members of our club, um, they have... Uh, they've been to the Arctic. They've, um, you know, they've they've traveled there, um, and would love to know what the application process was like to get on this expedition, so that maybe they could uh, follow in your footsteps. Oh yeah, um, yeah. It's called the Arctic Circle, and I highly recommend anybody to um, check it out and see when you know when their next expedition is. The Arctic Circle. Okay. Yeah. And what was that uh, application timeline like? Oh God, I don't remember. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. Remember, so yeah. it's on you guys to figure it yeah. out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. And then back to your voice, finding that voice. Yeah. So you, you were there for how long? Um, about three weeks. Three weeks. And yeah. 4,000 photographs. Oh, yeah. Sketches. Yeah. That's great. And then you, you came home and you kind of sat with that and you, uh, you developed this, uh, this work. Yeah. What are some notable pieces for you? Um, I have created a, a, it's very hard to describe, sort of a painting, right? But um, sure. I think probably the most notable pieces for me are the ones that look from a distance, well, this would be one. The, from a distance, it looks kind of white, and then you have this um, abstracted image. So hopefully that is uh, relatively evocative of water. Some people say that it looks like a sound wave. Um, but there, it's an organic shape. It's something that we know intrinsically is part of this planet. Yet it's m mostly a fabrication. 
um, insofar as I'm paying homage to the water that I saw, I'm paying homage to physics, I'm paying homage to real life things, but I've uh, really turned it on its head and, and created its, its completely own thing. Yeah, and you know, as we've moved through each image from each ocean, each uh, let's say I'll call it a sample of water. It, <laughs> there's such a, a unique feeling to each one with the through line that it is recognizably water. Mm -hmm. um, comic, tying back into something I said earlier, um, in a lot of paintings and in a lot of works, it's a, it's a footnote. So mm -hmm. to you know see water as the, the focal point is really interesting. Um, but beyond water, the Arctic has a lot more to offer. What else did you paint while you were up there? Santa. Santa, yeah. <laughs> I knew it. I knew he was there. <laughs> uh, any of the wildlife call out to you? I, I uh, did take some photographs of some wildlife. Um, I was lucky to, uh, I didn't see any polar bears, mm. but um, I did see a walrus, and he saw me, um, <laughs> and got to know that walrus a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I didn't. I those are the kinds of things that I might sketch. So in my sketchbooks, that's kind of a, they're kind of a personal record. There's something for me to, um, they're kind of like, almost like tourist sketches, right? Instead of tourist photos, they're like tourist sketches. It's like, oh, here I am with my friends. Oh, here I am with a walrus. Oh, here I am with a bird or whatever. Um, and I'm not worried about what a gallery is going to think. I'm not worried about what a museum is going to think. I'm, it's just, it's very much just a personal me having fun with that kind of thing. So I, I would say that mainly the non-water things were, um, photos and sketches. Gotcha, gotcha. And presumably this was on a much more modern ship. Yeah, it's from the 1950s. Wow, we're really, we're really charging into yeah. the future here. It, w it felt pretty darn modern to me, I can assure you. Yeah, it was pretty snazzy. Now, who else was on the boat with you? A bunch of artists. Love it. About 16 artists. That's From great. all over the world. Really interesting group. That's fantastic. Three weeks on a boat. Artists uh, yeah, so, working with their craft. Yeah, and and what we did was um, this was the first time that I was ever on an expedition where it was kind of organized by a group that does this kind of thing, and we would uh, hike all morning, and then we would sail someplace else and hike all afternoon, and then we would sail in overnight, and. Um, it was n nice in a way to not be a crew member for the first time, um, because then I could oh, really focus on sketching and, and taking even more photographs. So talk to me about the difference between crewing a ship, mm -hmm. uh, an ancient ship, mm -hmm. versus being just, just an artist on board working on you know, only your art. Talk to me about the different outcomes and the different inspirations that you found on both. I think that when I have been a crew member aboard these vessels. I'm very much about the team and getting there and making sure that you know the captain's happy and making sure that you know the navigation is correct, especially when you know when the waves are like this and the and the boat's spinning around like this, and I'm at the helm trying to read a compass and it's going like that. It's uh, a little stressful. Uh, so you know I'm very much thinking about those kinds of things or preparing a meal for 12 people, right? Because um, you would rotate through different crew duties. That's different than, and then in your spare time, you know, sketching and so forth. And you're thinking about what you've done for, during the day, you're thinking about where you're going to next, you're thinking about how, you know, how long you have to sleep before your next watch. Um, that's different from when you're creating art all the time, you're, or at least for me, that's, I go into art mode and I'm kind of in the zone and I'm, and I'm really diving down and getting those artistic ideas because that's all you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. When you're crewing, yeah. did you ever have an aha moment while you were uh, like working on dinner or, or uh, you were at the helm, uh, presumably? Um, so did that, you know, give you... Um, I guess the space to go, oh, you know, I've got to write this down or I've got to go and, and do this or, or God forbid, an aha moment that you couldn't remember later. 
yeah, I mean, it was like a series of aha moments all day long because my mind was completely blown. But one particular aha moment was I was keeping watch at night and um, along with uh, two other crew members, but I, I don't know where they were. It, you know, it was dark, right? And you're out in the open sea, so it's not like there's any lights and you're on a, on a wooden boat. And um, there was, you know, we'd been told and we had kind of seen and read about other instances where there might have been a cargo vessel that goes, you know, like 11 knots or, I don't know, really fast, and 50, I don't know how fast they go, really fast, um, and they were not gonna see a little wooden boat sort of bobbing like a cork right in the middle of the ocean. So I see this light, and it's coming right at me, and it's about two or three in the morning, and I'm like, oh man, I really don't wanna wake the captain. You know, I see this light, and I'm like, okay, how long till I wake the captain? And I don't know where the other two guys are that are supposed to be on watch. I don't know where they are, so I'm like, okay, it's on me. Do we get smashed to pieces, or do I wake the captain? And I, I had to kind of give it a serious thought. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll give it 20 minutes. And I give it 20 minutes, and we're not smashed yet, and, but there's that light, and it's still coming right at us. And that's when I realized after the 20 minutes, before I woke up the captain, it was a star. And it oh, was wow. right on the horizon because there was no light pollution. You know, even in the desert here, you have enough light pollution where you wouldn't see a star right exactly on the horizon. And that was definitely a hot moment in lots of ways. Wow, fantastic. That's a fantastic <laughs> moment. Um, moving back to the Arctic, I, I'm thinking about these artists, these 16 artists. Did you key off of each other's inspiration? Oh, yeah. Talk oh, about yeah, some definitely. of those moments where there was kind of cross-pollination between uh, disciplines. I think disciplines and also th the way that they approach their artwork. Um, so there's this one artist that I'm thinking of right now who, um, she makes ice sculptures. So that's all she does is she goes around the world, you know, mainly in the places where it's cold, and creates these ice sculptures. And there'll be giant ice sculptures that people can walk into. And she does that um, at her university as well, which I think, I can't remember where it is, but um, yeah. And that, that was uh, just the, one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my entire life. Fantastic. Any other uh, inspiring artists on this ship? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, but I, I would definitely say that that was the most inspiring one, because it's, it's art that is very rare, hard to make, can't make it in many places, and you could literally immerse yourself in it. Hmm. It's pretty cool. Now, was she taking pictures or video, or was she just carving it for the sake of the carving? So on this particular expedition, she wasn't carving because she hmm. wasn't there long enough to create. I mean, you know, and she would have like her students and different people helping her and ah. things like that. So yeah, I think she was mainly uh, taking photographs. Gotcha. Yeah. So we've we've come to the Arctic, which was 2019. It was the last. Uh, ocean that you wanted to record and paint. Um, what's next for you? What does it look like uh, moving forward? Well, so the Southern Ocean, um, I, wa I traveled to the Southern Ocean in 2019, and I thought it was going to be like the Arctic, mm. right? Um, and I was wrong, yet again. I was wrong. It was even more abstract. Um, of course, it's completely different flora and fauna, but also the shapes are very different because you have the tabular icebergs, right? Mm -hmm. So these tabular icebergs that are so famous, um, you don't have those in the north. You only have those in the south, and you have the penguins in the south. <laughs> and there they are. And so um, that was where I really studied those. And then you ask, what's next? Yes. So I am currently working on a series about the San Francisco Bay. 
I am studying the San Francisco Bay from all sides. And um, so I've taken one little mini expedition up there, and I realized that it could be my life's work. There's, it's massive. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm learning all about the history and the different kinds of flora and fauna and different kinds of marshlands and waterways. So. Now, is this going to be as like hyper-specific as the texture of water, or is this a more broad approach? We shall see. Oh, I love it. Now, because we have a large audience tonight, I'd love to open it up to questions a little bit early, curate a little bit, uh, jump in with some of my own as the conversation develops. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and someone with a microphone will find you. I've got one in the back. I'm sorry, at the beginning, you, you talked about William Hodges and Captain Cook and, and uh, Frank Hurley and, uh, and Ernest Shackleton. I know that Frank Hurley and Shackleton were on the same expedition. Who was Will, William Hodges? He, William Hodges was Captain Cook's artist. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you've talked a lot about oceans at this point. Um, obviously, those aren't the only you know, bodies of water that we have. There's countless beautiful lakes, rivers, streams, everything. Um, you know, what are your feelings on, you know, exploring that kind of thing? And, um, or are you really just, you know, focus on the major oceans? Obviously, they're very different. You know, once some are significantly more violent, passionate, energetic than others. But, yeah, just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, that's a good question. So while I've been working on One Artist, Five Oceans, I've also continued to paint these other kinds of water. So I have painted and photographed um, water puddles. Fountains, rivers, streams, lakes, um, icebergs, of course, uh, you name it. Yeah, definitely. Mountain lakes, those are the, those are the most fun because you, have to, you, you get to hike up there to, to see them. So uh, before the next question, I'd like to ask, when did uh, the series on water take on its uh, conservation uh, message? Well, I've always had that message in my work. So before I was painting water, I was painting trees, and I was painting animals, and I was painting portraits. And so, for example, the portraits have an environmental message. The trees have an environmental message. Um, when I was at university, I was working on uh, all of my pieces had an environmental message. So I think that no matter where I ended up in life, whether I was an accountant or a teacher or a plumber or whatever I would have ended up doing, I think it would have had that layer to it. Love it. <laughs> One in the back. Hello. So I just love everything about you. Like, you're very interesting, <laughs> and you're a real-life person who says all of these things about how important the earth is, and then it goes out and does it. I think that that's just so rad, and I love the way that you've brought it all together. Um, my question is, how do you feel like now being to all of these oceans and seeing how they all connect, like what would you say would be the most powerful force of connecting our earth or is it just everything is separate and I don't know if how, to, I don't know if that's the right way to uh, phrase that question. Like. <laughs> How does the overall Earth, like after being there, how does that actually make you feel um, just in general? Because I know you were saying you want to make sure that your art makes people feel, but how did like being everywhere on Earth, on the ocean, like how does that make your soul feel? Thank you. Um, I think, I, I hope, hope, tell me if I don't answer your question. Um, I think realizing out in the open ocean, like so many members will know, you feel very small and you feel very vulnerable. And ironically, I find that empowering because that lets me know that, um, you know, we're all just kind of going after the same thing, regardless of what country we're from or, you know, what religion we are, or, or any of these sorts of, of separated kind of things that, that humans put in the way, we're all connected by the oceans. All water is connected. Um, you know, the atoms that are in water now are the same atoms that were in water, you know, a million years ago. So um, I think, I guess, to answer your question, I feel like that is what connects us. 
And so I feel very connected with the earth, but I also feel very connected with um, all people from all different cultures. So to paraphrase. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> such a, a hyper-specific, such a micro view of water. Mm -hmm. You were able to see the planet in a more holistic way. Yeah. I love yeah. that. That's fantastic. Yeah. Question uh, here. <clears throat> so two, <clears throat> two questions. I couldn't help but notice your motive power was sailboat, and I assume that's connected to the ecology aspect. And uh, could you sail much in the Arctic, or did you end up motoring around? And question number two is if you're looking for new frontiers in water and You've talked about streams and rivers and puddles. How about that other form of water, clouds? Oh, very nice, yeah. Um, I do love painting clouds. It's fun, it's very fun. Um, I would say that the, uh, the sailboats found me. I was very lucky that that, that, that came into my life. Um, Is everybody awake? <laughs> was that me? Did I do that? It was somebody with a mic. I, my mic might be dead, actually. That might have been me. OK. Are we back? We're back. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, people, uh, yes, please continue. Yeah. Um, Yes, definitely the, the ship had a motor in Antarctica and um, also in the Arctic as well. Um, as it so happens, there was no wind when we were in the Arctic. I mean, almost zero wind. It was windier probably in California than it was in the Arctic. Mm. Yeah. Question in the back. Hi. Hi. Danielle, it's been a real... Um, blessing this uh, learn about your process uh, when you first thought about uh, your career um, and then you ended up on these trips did you ever have any seasickness I'm just... hell yeah uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I get really sick yeah I get I get really sick I was so impressed because you just like it seemed like you just went on these voyages and you know, I wondered if you knew kind of what was in store for you. No, I'm 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 one of those uh, people who will just start playing a board game without reading the instructions. Okay, well that's cool. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's maybe not the most clever way to do things, but I tend to, as I mentioned earlier, I tend to just kind of insert myself and just kind of go for it. I, yeah. well, it's been really enjoyable and inspiring Thank you. to. Watch your process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh oh, Steve. No, Danielle. <laughs> tell us about the two hairiest circumstances on each of the replica ships. You must have been in a bad storm in one or two of them. Great what question. that was like being in that kind of an ancient ship. I was in. Um, I was in one. I believe it was a Gale Force Seven. Um, I w would need to check on that, but I think it was a Gale Force 7 um, uh, storm. Uh, believe it or not, in the Mediterranean. I mean, the Mediterranean is giant. And it was, it was one where I was at the helm for part of it. And it was literally, as I mentioned earlier, so if this is a wave, right, the wave is doing this, right? It's like doing this. And here's our little boat. So you go up here in the boat, there's, we have these two, um, rudders and they're completely out of the water. Both of them are completely out of the water. And with the wind and everything, we're just like spinning around like a like a top. And I was, you know, looking at the compass and the captain was like, we're 15 degrees off. And I'm like, oh, I, can't, I don't know what to do about that. Um, so. Um, <laughs> and which boat were you on? Which ship? That, that was on the Phoenicia. The Phoenicia. Yeah, that Can was we put on the that Phoenicia. picture up of the Phoenicia? And uh, so, yeah, so that was pretty harrowing. I mean, we literally battened down the hatches, quite literally. And it was one of those where you can see the horizon, if you will, uh, water on that side it, through the, you know, before we closed the hatches. And then you can see it on that side. And there was, you know, the waves were coming right over. It's just kind of like in a movie, right? The waves were just coming right over us like this. And I wouldn't say that I was scared. I was, I think, more uh, concerned with 
not screwing up the directions for the captain, but I wasn't, I wasn't ever scared. Danielle, yes. do you have an update on what's happening with the Phoenicia? Because maybe people will be interested, they might be able to see it in the museum in yes. all places of Iowa. Yes, so um, the Phoenicia is being rebuilt. Um, so I'll tell you first about the Borbador ship. The Borbador ship is in the Borbador Museum complex. So if any of you um, have been to the Borbador Temple since August 31st, 2005, you can see it there. And um, you can see uh, the genuine Tupperware that we used. <laughs> and you'll see my mug shot amongst others um, under glass. And then um, the Phoenicia is being re-put together. So there was a second Phoenicia ship expedition where the same boat was used to cross the Atlantic um, to show uh, what the migration of some people might have been around the time of Christ. And now that is that ship has been purchased by the Mormon church and it is being put back together in Iowa and hopefully will be open for people to come and visit uh, within the next year or so. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Got a question right here in the middle. So I'm assuming you didn't bring these larger canvases with you on the vessels. So I'm wondering, are these um, just recreations of an exact smaller piece, or did you develop your ideas further when you returned home? And if so, how did your relationship to the pieces change when you did that? That is a great question. Um, I think it was Monet who used to um, call his, the pieces that he would do when he would go to different cities, he would call them his tourist pieces. And that was um, a kind of a, a put down that he would give his own work. He considered his first ideas to be um, you know, nothing more than what you might see, you know, on your tour. Um, and that, then he would take them back to the studio and he would work them up into what he considered to be, you know, different, different kind of works, better works. Um, and I, I feel kind of similarly, the works in my sketchbook, the works that I do when I'm on an expedition are my first impressions. And so they're usually, uh, you know, kind of fun for me, but they won't be very fresh or something that everybody won't have seen someplace else. So it's really taking those ideas back into the studio and working them up. Um, I say working them up, really adapting them, evolving them, sometimes literally chopping them and changing them to get, um, to let them grow into new ideas, that that's when the kind of the magic begins. Um, for the first, uh, for the Borbador ship expedition, um, because I was away um, in Africa for actually seven months, all told, Asia and Africa, I did take all of my own canvas and all of my own paint with me, because um, I just didn't know when I was ever going to, you know, it's not like there's art stores in the port, right? Because um, we didn't go to tourist ports, we just went to, uh, you know, where they were working on ships and things. There were, there were no... Uh, no kind of pleasure sailboats or anything like that where we were. Um, and I tried painting on the ship, but I learned very quickly that linen or, or even if it were canvas, that's sailcloth, right? So if you, were, if you were even to find a piece of space, a little bit of space on a ship where you could paint, um, as soon as you pick it up, it's gonna, it's gonna, ah. right? So I did, I did do, I did create one painting and, um, or a couple of paintings, but when I, and I was very careful about, you know, getting it out of the way, because I didn't want to, you know, get in the way of the crew, again, you know, in case that we did have to do something with the sails and so forth. And, but then I came back this one time, I don't know where I was, I must have just like walked over there and came back, and there was this giant, footprint right in the middle of my painting. 
and it, it was fine because I, I realized that I was, you know, my, my stuff was in the way. So I said, uh, who stepped in my painting? And nobody said anything, you know. Who stepped in my painting? Nobody said anything. And then when we finally got to shore, we had a little bit of R&R &R time, and um, we found this, this little tiny hotel that had a pool, and of course, nobody had bathed in four weeks. So, literally. So, um, everyone was sitting, bang, bang, sitting by the pool, and I saw this man that had one blue foot. <laughs> <laughs> And it was the captain, and I'm like, Alan, come on. Anyway. <laughs> That's <is> great. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> Got one question in the front mm -hmm. here. Caught uh, blue-footed. You again. Hi. Walk us through your experience and your <laughs> process you. here. It's Thank just you. really fascinating how you're uh, helping like us, like put us on the ship with you. Uh, one of the theme, well, two of the themes I really enjoyed about your talk were the viscerality, whether it's like the traditional materials and like your inspiration for using those, or just your crew involvement, but also the abstraction of having to distill hundreds of these sketches into these pieces and finding like the character of these oceans. And I feel like that's such a fun area of play to as you're creating your work. And I was wondering, where do you hope the audience will land in that relationship between viscerality and abstraction, or where are some conversations that were unexpected but also enjoyable that you found your art generated? Wow. Uh, Sounds like I, we have an artist in the yeah, crowd. Yeah, <laughs> I, I could write a whole piece on that question. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Um, so my work has some history, some art, some science, um, you know, uh, some politics, right? Depending on which countries we went to, um, some geography. There's a there's a little bit of something, some environmental stuff. Um, so my goal is to bring you in. You know, I want to bring you in. I want to talk, and I, I don't mean literally. I mean through the work, right? I want to interact with you through the artwork. I want to have that conversation. Um, and it might, I might not even be there. It might just be you looking at a painting and I'm you know, someplace else. But, but I'm sort of in that painting in a way, I guess. Um, so I guess that's what I'm looking for, is that, that kind of interaction between the viewer and the artwork. Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> okay. I, my initial read of that was, especially now getting to see them like in scale, uh -huh. it's just like, I feel in the same way you had to realize or came to realize that you were just as connected to everything as the water is. I'm like, oh, this is such a wonderful distillation of like how water behaves and like also kind of confronted with, oh, this is only one way I get to experience it. Like this is a limitation of my sight and how I interact with life and the world around me. And it feels, I'm, I'm getting that viscerality in your abstraction and I'm really enjoying like that space. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We have one more question. Andrew, that was a fantastic question. But um, I agree. It's going to give me a lot more to think about when I take a shower next. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and an, another thing I liked about that, that discussion is it brought up uh, kind of my own uh, question, which was a uh, question of perspective and scale. One of the things that I really enjoy, especially about these pieces, is the uh, our, uh, especially the one that I, I believe is profiling the Arctic, or is that the Antarctic? For that, for the one that's on the right. Those are the, both the Arctic. Both actually, Arctic. Yeah. Uh, how do you approach scale when you're planning out and plotting out a piece? Because the one on the right almost seems like it could be a top down from a great height, but it also could be right on the the waterfront as well. So I'm just interested. Do you, when you approach perspective, is it always from an eye level, or sometimes are you thinking in more of a almost a grandiose landscape or seascape? That's a, that's a great question. I do, as you can tell, I do like to kind of uh, look closely, and as you mentioned, I like to really make that very specific portrait of things. Um, Sometimes my works, I did one of the water outside Syria, for example, um, where I'm just looking right at the surface of water so that you see those kind of stripes that the waves form when they are um, reflecting the light in the sky. 
um, sometimes I like to look straight down, like so that painting that's on the left is um, from a town called Pyramidin um, in Svalbard, which is a uh, kind of a Russian ghost town. Mm. Um, the one on the right is, uh, that's me playing with your head, so I'm glad that it did. Um, that's really most mainly from my own head. Um, yeah, but yeah, I, I enjoy looking at, at water from different perspectives. Um, and I include the marginal seas, you know, when I'm talking about the oceans. So it might be closer into port where you have more interaction with, you know, things that were made by humans reflecting in the water because that's another whole story. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm so happy I had this opportunity to interview you and, and share this with the crowd tonight. Follow uh, her, Art. Yes, <laughs> follow her, Eubank Art. I would also like to give a special thanks to all those who donated to the raffle tonight, uh, starting with the Surfrider Foundation of Los Angeles, the Los Angeles chapter, uh, the Duchess Yacht Charters, Island Packers Cruises, the Santa Barbara Adventure Company, Fun Surf Los Angeles, Captain Dave's Dolphin Safari, Heal the Bay Aquarium, yeah. Gray Whale Gin, Duke's Malibu, Danielle Eubank, of course, whose art is still up for uh, auction or, or bid, so please put more tickets in that one, it's fantastic. Uh, Laird Hamilton, James Michael Dorsey, our own Kevin Lee, uh, who's a member of the club, and Kathy Gidget Coner. Thank you for joining us tonight, it was an absolute pleasure. Great, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.